am going to go ahead and introduce Vince here. Uh, so our first speaker for today's symposium is Vince Batro from NICS out in Tennessee, and Vince has been working with PI Diego Donzis of Texas A&M, and Diego's been with the Supercomputer Center's program for a very long time, I think probably even prior to uh, TerraGrid days in a student in, I want to say maybe George Carniadakis' group at Brown. Um, Diego does compressible turbulence simulation, and he's been looking at some um, fine-grained analysis to catch some aspects of small-scale turbulence, and what Vince has been doing is working with Diego um, to implement MPIIO so that these, um, these higher resolution simulations can continue to run in the same length of time, but now you have much more detail and you're writing out uh, much more output, and you're still doing that um, in an acceptable time period. So this, I think, will be of interest to many of us in ECSS um, who are doing you know, large-scale optimization of I.O. So with that, we will let uh, Vince take it away here. Oh, thanks for the great introduction, Nancy, and uh, thanks to everybody for being here, and hopefully I'll hold your attention. Um, again, I was working with Diego Donzis, who was indeed a student with George Carniadakis, who I worked with him and one of his other students previous to Diego. So I uh, uh, quite enjoyed working with those two codes, DNS and FOSTA. It's been really, um, they're really excellent CFD codes. As, as a CFD guy, I hold that close to my heart. So, um, <clears throat> But I do want to talk to you all about uh, using MPIIO uh, as well as file striping to, to assist in some of these very arduous tasks when we're scaling up problems to incredibly large sizes. Uh, we need to squeeze every ounce of performance out of the machine possible. Now, um, when I'm having, when I'm discussing this, uh, I will be discussing the project that we ran on Kraken, and I realize Kraken's going away in 15 days, but uh, the things that we were doing on Kraken apply to other systems as well, uh, the Cray systems as well as uh, non-Cray systems, cluster systems. Anything that can use MPIO and has a Lustre file system attached to it can take advantage of this. So effectively what we were uh, looking at uh, was taking some of this compressible turbulence simulations and scaling them up uh, from resolutions of 512 to the third to resolutions of 1024 to the third. All right, so effectively we doubled the resolution in each of the three spatial dimensions, uh, which is, is non-trivial in this particular case. Um, it, it sounds like it's only eight times more uh, complicated, but, you know, as we all know, things are not perfectly linear, and the transition is never quite as trivial as we expect it to be. So uh, in doing this, when we were able to run these simulations, what we found is that um, <clears throat> we actually saw slowdown as we added more cores to these simulations. So we have these simulations that barely fit on the, note, on the um, core counts that had previously been optimized for. And we needed to optimize them for much larger core counts because we needed, you know, to continue to scale this problem out. Uh, for anyone that's, you know, vaguely um, knowledgeable about compressible turbulence or any kind of turbulence, the smaller the scale you're working on, the better. Uh, DNS, the code that, that Diego uses, is a, is a direct numerical simulation code, and so it is extremely uh, dependent on having these high-resolution particle fields uh, for interactions to actually be sensible. So uh, one of the things I mentioned in this abstract, which is a terrible slide, I'm just going to have to point out a couple of these slides are just terrible slides, but I wanted to give you all information, uh, <laughs> is the fact that um, previously uh, there were two different core counts, 32,000 and 64,000, that not only slowed the process down, but actually went outside of the wall time window and were completely, completely unable to run. And that was just completely unacceptable. Um, and considering the fact that this code has been around for many years and has been very highly optimized in a computational sense, I.O. seemed to be the, the most obvious place to go first to see what we could do to make things uh, less contentious. So uh, I'm going to kind of give an overview of some of the things we discussed. Uh, and, uh, and and looked at in, in coming up to this, and then I'll come out with some conclusions as to what we actually did to to speed things up slash or keep them from growing out of out of out of reach. 
so why do we need large CFD simulations? Again, uh, we're using a direct numerical simulation model instead of, say, a RANS model or Reynolds Average Navi or Stokes. Um, when you're looking at these sort of very small-scale turbulent problems, uh, some of the things that we assume away in RANS or that we, uh, are, uh, you know, some of these very high Reynolds number throw, uh, flows uh, just become intractable to do with that method. And so we need something that has very high resolution, very high particle counts, so that we can actually uh, attempt to simulate what's actually going on. So uh, even a small chunk of particles can require billions of data points. So when we talked about doing something that's 1024 to the third, we were talking about a, you know well over a billion, but approximately a billion data points, and that is you know effectively a billion uh, in this case water molecules or air molecules. So it's a very very small area that we're looking at here, and we need it to be very highly accurate. So of course we have our wonderful HPC system that's supposed to come to the rescue, right? Magically, everything should scale up uh, perfectly, and of course it doesn't. Uh, I love this quote, a supercomputer is a device for converting a CPU-bound problem into an I.O.-bound problem. That is exactly what we had here. Um, so, of course, you know, you have your compute nodes and your interconnect and your I.O. infrastructure, and so what people generally tend to do is they work on single node performance, they work on their network performance, but people don't really generally run into I.O. and start working on it until it becomes a real problem. And often it doesn't become a real problem until you start scaling up to tens of thousands of cores. Um, you know, I always used to say, as you go up by an order of magnitude, your problems change each time. So from 16 cores to 100 and, uh, 128 cores to 1,000 cores. And when you start getting up into the thousands of cores, I.O. suddenly rears its ugly head and, and people just tend to just kind of run away. So <clears throat> here's an example of a situation, you know, if you have a 24-hour simulation on 16 cores, 1% of your runtime is serial I.O., now you scale up the compute part of your code to 1,024 cores, you have 64 times speed up in compute, but I.O. is now 39% of the runtime. <laughs> um, so I.O. does not nicely just follow right along with compute. It's a completely different paradigm that you have to address. And again, we don't want to waste resources. More importantly, if we're on a shared parallel file system, whatever I do that causes incredible um, slowdowns in the Lustre file system is going to affect everybody else's performance. So not only are you hurting yourself, but you're hurting everybody else on that resource. Um, Again, I.O. subsystems are, are generally pretty slow, okay? They, they only have a certain amount of uh, uh, bandwidth that they can actually pump to the computer, and, and, and you can quickly saturate that. And then, of course, as soon as you saturate that, you just have to wait. You just have to have everybody standing in line, and there's really nothing you can do to scale your code further because you can add more nodes, but it's just going to make the I.O. worse. Um, the unfortunate reality is there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, that would be great, but usually uh, you have to really kind of try some different combinations. We can, we can point you in the right direction of environment variables, of file striping, of those sorts of things, but often you, there is some play, and you'll see here in my um, slides that I had tried several different options be, between environment variables and collective buffering and all those other things before I finally settled on something that looked like it would scale consistently and did. Um, so again, uh, bottlenecks in performance can occur all over the place, but generally speaking, the more you consider your I.O. to be a bottleneck in the code you're writing, if you are trying to optimize that bottleneck out for a specific architecture, you're probably going to kill yourself on another architecture. So you really don't want to overly um, uh, go to extremes with this I.O. Okay, so there are several ways to go. This is a very, very con common way. This is the serial I.O. option, right? Uh, one process performs the I.O., and it sends out the information to everybody else, or it gathers information from everybody else and, and writes that to disk. Um, it doesn't really scale. As you add more processors, you add more problems. Now, the upside is that 
you're not going to see the same contention issues that you would see if you have multiple files writing to the disk and that number is growing, right? You have one file writing to the disk and the slowness is actually involved in the uh, collection of that data to that process to be then written to disk. And that is a little easier for some folks to wrap their head around as far as trying to, to, to manage that process efficiently and effectively um, in order to get that one process to, to, do, to do the master's job perfectly. Uh, that is probably the most common solution because it's, like I said, it's within that normal communication bottleneck that we're all more familiar with how to, how to fix. Um, but it doesn't really scale, and it is something that eventually will cause your code to crumble and, and screech to a halt. Um, so, so then there's the other option, right? So you go, okay, we'll do a file per process, and this is this is what people generally tend to do on smaller systems. They go, okay, I've got 128 processes, I'll do 128 files, and everybody and, and everybody's you know, there's no contention for that spot on disk, and everything should be okay, and that's okay until you start to have large process counts, right? Because as soon as you go to large process counts, now you have 10,000 files sitting on one disk and 10,000 processes all trying to write or read from that one disk. And that becomes a serious bottleneck, a serious point of contention. <clears throat> so this next option doesn't seem a whole lot better, right? You go, okay, it's not a file per process. You're sharing a file where everybody is actually working on a different part of that file. And you think, okay, well that at least, at least everybody's not getting in a line. Everybody's kind of being able to work simultaneously. But you're still having to go through that one singular network connection or, or what have, you know, one object storage server uh, to that one file location. So even if you're only working on different parts of it, there's still a limitation as to how many of you can be touching that file at a given time. All right, so we start to, to, to look at some combinations of this, right? We start to say, okay, maybe if we can aggregate some of these together, then we can utilize that, the benefit of the scalability of, of the, the, you know, the communication between, say, a subset of processes talking to one process, and then you know, there's maybe 10 sets of those, and each of those 10 can then turn around and talk to the disk. Um, this is definitely a win, you decrease your contention in your file system because you have less people trying to talk to the object, ser uh, the object storage server. And uh, by the same token, you increase your file system usage because you're all uh, writing to different parts of the file and looking at different parts of the system. So this, this sort of shared file I.O. Um, is, is really quite good. Uh, and what, that's actually what we're going to look at. We also could call that collective buffering, but again, I'll, I'll get into some of that parlance in, in a minute here. Um, so before I get too deeply into this, I've been kind of assuming a cognizance of, of luster that I, I probably shouldn't assume, and so I'm going to go back here and, and briefly discuss what an OSS and an OST is. Uh, so for, for all intents and purposes, you have an object storage server or an OSS which effectively is kind of an aggregation point for several OSTs, which are object storage targets. These are kind of disks. All they do is they store data. They may have chunks of one file on several different OSTs, okay? Um, and that's, in a given OSS, just says, okay, I know what data is on my OSTs, and it acts as sort of a, a, of a gatekeeper, okay? Um, so, there we go. I wanted to get to a better picture here. Uh, all right. Okay. So here's a situation where you have a file where it's been striped over several different OSTs. So, inst and so if you have a situation where you have one file or one process still trying to read or write to that file, even if it's spread over multiple OSTs, you're still stuck at the bottleneck of one process. If you have all processes trying to read or write to that file that's now split up over several OSTs, if you have this, a number of processes that's commensurate with the number of OSTs, or close even, even if it's double or triple or quadruple 
um, that's still not terrible, right? That's still a situation where maybe you have four or five folks in contention for that same little chunk of a file, and you're probably going to get away with that because you'll have enough other other um, <coughs> synchronicity that things will tend to work themselves out. The problem becomes now you have a file, say, set over 30 different OSTs, split into 30 pieces, and you have 10,000 um, MPI tasks trying to write or read from it. And so now you have 10,000 divided by 30 processors all in contention for that one OST, okay? That is a problem. That is where you can stripe all you want, but if you're not utilizing some other sort of I.O. schema to collect that information and buffer it, everybody is still going to be in contention. Just because you take your army and divide them into four groups and run them all, try to get them all through a small hole in a wall, uh, doesn't mean they're going to be any faster at it. It just means that maybe group one will get through, and then group two, three, and four all fight each other out for who comes next. All right, so again, the goal here is to minimize contention. So you want to spread things out in such a way that everybody's going to be able to access their part of a file in a reasonably intelligent and, um, uh, sorry, I'm looking for the right word here, uh, calm sort of manner, collected sort of manner. So that's just sort of a quick overview of what we talked about. I'm trying not to, to go over my time here. Um, how do we do that? Okay, so it sounds really great. Okay, I can stripe a file. Okay, I can be cognizant of not having one file or every or one rank or every rank try to write to a process. But where's this happy medium? Do I actually have to go into my code and, and, and write, you know, okay, uh, if I have this many processors, I want to divide it into three groups or no, I don't have to do that. I have this wonderful thing called MPIO, which is part of MPI, and you link and compile just like you, anything else you would do with MPI, except that you have these wonderful situations where you have automaticity rules um, or at, at, atomicity rules and collective I.O. options. What does that mean? Okay, well, what that means is that MPIO can actually have each MPI task work independently, just like you have done kind of in the past. Um, you know, each file, each process is writing to a file, or several processes are, are working on different parts of one file. But this is the really nice part. It supports derived data types. And so what you can do, and this is what we did in, in, in Diego's code, uh, was there were these matrices that we wanted to stride through and pull off certain pieces of information for certain processors. And so MPIO allows the use of those derived data types that he was using in the communication anyways uh, in, within the code to be used in the I.O. portion of the code as well saving you more agglomeration work, saving you, you know, creating these sort of uh, pseudo buffers underneath the covers that you, you actually have to do explicitly. Um, and then there's the collective I.O. And collective I.O. allows the MPI library to do the I.O. optimization. That's really crucial. Based on the system you're on, the environment variables you pass it, and several other factors, the MPI at compile time will act, or excuse me, at runtime will actually determine what it wants to do for I/O. It will say, "Oh, okay, I should collect these 30 processors into one collective buffer, and then talk back and forth to the disk with them." Okay, so it kind of helps you with how to aggregate that collective reading and writing in, a, in an intelligent way, given the system, given the specifics of the, the hardware, and given the specifics of your code. All right, and as you can see, it's very much the same as is going in and, and running a you know uh, f open. It's just a slightly different command. You know, you can get the file size, you can set the buffer size, you can have it seep through that file to the point where it is supposed to be to start reading the data. It actually sets that into a file handler, and then you're able to use that file handler to find the spot to start reading your data from. So again, it works very similarly to regular I.O., but it has some wonderful optimizations insofar as collective I.O. and, and non-contiguous data, uh, derived data types, uh, being able to read that in a, in a very efficient manner. Okay. Uh, sorry, wrong button there. 
So again, as you can see, you don't have to do the aggregation. What it's going to do, this is a situation, by the way, where you have four files, okay, and they are maybe striped across two OSTs, two disks here, right? And they've been striped in such a way that they are wonderfully, you know, you've got a green and a green and a green and a green, and they're not right next to each other, and everybody can, can you know, the process zero can go to two different OSTs and two different spots on those two different OSTs, uh, or on those two OSSs. So you maybe actually have two OSTs and one OSS, OST, OST, OSS, right? Uh, and so effectively, process zero with no contention can go right down to each chunk of the file it's interested in, as can process one, two, and three. In doing that, you don't have to come up with the chunking scheme. It will do that for you because it knows what your file size striping is for Lustre. It knows how many OSTs and OSSs are on the system. It can do all that stuff using its own heuristics completely without you having to tell it anything. So what are some things that you need to set in order to uh, make this most productive? Well, one, you've got to let MPIIO understand that it needs to align itself with the luster striping of the files, that you have a parallel file system, and that's something it needs to take into consideration. You can give it other hints, and we'll talk about what those hints are. And obviously, you can set a striping factor for these files that are created with MPIIO. Um, we were writing into and reading out of files that were already striped, so we didn't have to use these. But basically what you can do with those environment variables is say, uh, if you're going to write a brand new file, go ahead and stripe it to this because this is how I've got the rest of my files striped. Okay. Um, here are the base, some of the most important options for the CREXT5 Kraken. But what I really want you guys to see is the specifics I use. So very briefly, um, you know, reading small shared files from a single task, totally the way to go. All right, if you have a small file, so you're not going to have to communicate a large amount of data, go ahead and read it and broadcast it. Because the, 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 the communication network on Kraken or any supercomputer is going to be much faster than the I.O. Uh, network. All right. Um, you can stripe count things to one, right? If you're under a gigabyte and it's only being accessed by a single process, you don't want to stripe it because then that process has to go to several different OSTs. However, if it's huge enormous and you really want uh, that single process to be able to go grab chunks of it at a time, you may want to stripe it, but not over stripe it, no more than four. Uh, a large file, okay? Uh, you definitely want to go with something larger than four. I often suggest, as you'll see in the next slides, uh, the negative one option, which just says stripe it across every OSS and OST you have. All right. Limiting the number of files within a single directory also makes Lustre's job simpler insofar as where it needs to put things in order for them to be um, connected to each other. Uh, small files on single OSTs. And directories containing small files, many small files in a single OST. So if you have a whole bunch of small files in a directory, it would be great if your single process that was doing all the work could just go back and forth to that one OST, didn't have to keep looking around for where it was supposed to find chunks of the file. Obviously, do not open and close a file unless you have to. All right? It's not necessarily a bad thing to leave a file open while you perform some other computational work because if you do, you, you, you save some overhead of opening and closing. All right, so let's briefly talk about what I specifically did on Diego's code so um, that I'm not uh, running way over time. Uh, looks like I'm okay. So uh, under the original implementation, it took a really long time to run an 8,000 core job, but it actually took three times longer to run it with 16,000 cores. So no matter the benefit that we were able to obtain, we should have seen it two times or you know, maybe one and a half, let's say, even if I.O. was causing a little issue, speed up. We actually got a three times slowdown. And with 32,000 cores, it completely ran out of memory. So uh, Diego had gone in before I got there and actually put in the MPIIO um, instead of just doing a single, you know, single process broadcast situation. Uh, but he didn't use any collective buffering. MPIO is pretty smart, but it's not smart enough to be able to 
know when you want it to collect and conquer or when you want everybody to be sent out independently. So we tried different striping sizes. Didn't make a huge difference. We changed the MPI, the MPitch unexpected event buffer, which is saying, you know, here's extra room if things come through that you weren't expecting. Let's not run into swap or, or, or cause issues with con uh, uh, contiguous memory. Um, none of that stuff helped. And so it actually became very obvious that, that what we really needed to do was collectively buffer, that the single process solution and the file per task solution were no good. And so what we needed to do was find a happy medium. And so we did set the stripe count to all OSTs, which is minus C, negative 1. Uh, now we can run the 32,000 and 64,000 core jobs successfully with MPIO and faster than the multi-file implementation. And as one grows the core count, yes, the wall time is going to grow to some degree, um, uh, ever so slightly, in, insofar as, you know, eventually you can, you can use too many cores, right? We all know that just from a computing standpoint. You can throw too many resources at a problem. And here, you know, of course, I.O. is going to cause some negative effect, but you don't want it to overshadow any good effects that you get out of scaling up processors to... to, to, um, to, to to shrink down the individual little problems you're having to solve. So what we did is we used uh, these MPIO hints, and we enabled the uh, collective buffering reading and writing. Okay, um, That's the CD versus the DS. Now, we don't actually have to set that as disabled, but it doesn't hurt. I like to be pedantic. Um, we have some environment variables here that will let us know what it's doing. And so we were able to actually watch the I.O. happen, watch the sorts of uh, calculations it was putting together. Um, we said, hey, by the way, go ahead and align with luster striping and boundaries. This is something that's very specific to the XT5. Um, so I wouldn't, I'm not going to spend any real time on it, but this is an error message that you can get when it's having issues with using portals. <laughs> which is an XT5 thing, don't worry about it. Uh, and again, this is your how you set from the head directory that you want all the files to be set to be a stripe count of the full number of OSTs on the system. So here's the beautiful thing. Here's the, here's the wonderful plot, okay? When we use the MPIO naive implementation with that collective buffer, you see that things got infinitely worse between 8,000 and 16,000 cores, and then these, these jobs just couldn't even run. Okay, That was just an assumed how much worse could it get. Now, when we use the collective buffering uh, with a stripe count of just one, you see that things improve, but it's still not very good. All right? Things are still not quite back to where we are just at the root-centered I.O., the real simple um, uh, approach. So we said, well, let's just try striping everything. And when we did, when we striped it to the full count of OSTs, you can see that we're actually able to beat the performance of the root-centered I.O. Uh, just by using collective buffering, having it group itself into sort of smaller groups of processors to talk. Uh, and, uh, and and striping things over the full amount of OSTs, because obviously we don't have 64,000 OSTs. Uh, so as a consequence, it was you know no problem to, to make sure there was plenty of work for them all to do. Um, I do want to thank Bilal Hadri for some of the great pictures about the parallel I.O. so I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. But uh, really what I want to say, other than thank you all for listening and, and open the floor up to questions, is the real key to this whole thing is that your I.O. should never at any point completely overshadow any gains you make in computational scaling. Uh, it can make it, a, it, it, can, it can reduce the scaling from a nice linear factor uh, that it should be, but it should not completely negate it. And that's exactly what we were seeing when we weren't using collective buffering. So with that, thank you, and I'll open the floor to questions. Vince, thank you very much. That was a tremendous talk that engendered lots of conversation in the room that I'm at here in SDSC. At SDSC with people who do a lot of MPIIO is very clearly presented. Uh, we have requests for the slides already, and I'm glad that we've recorded um, this. One. I think this will be very useful. Do we have any questions from, from other folks on the line at this time?
Yeah, that, that was just an outstandingly clear presentation of how to go about I.O. optimization. Thank you very much. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I was uh, definitely trying to make that clear as a non-trivial thing. So thank you very much, everybody. And I will be sending these slides to Nancy while I'm listening to our next presentation. So thanks. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll post them on the symposium website. And there's also a link with uh, Vince's contact information if folks have follow-up questions. And probably you'll want to um, stop sharing your desktop, Vince, and then I think I can grab control back and uh, give it to our next speaker. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there we go. Great. Um, you can just keep it for yourself, Nancy, and, uh, and Joel will just tell you when to uh, switch the slides, whichever you prefer. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's fine. I'm happy to advance the slides. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting the way these symposium talks come about. So Vince's work with Diego was from someone who's been doing high-performance computing for years and years, and this is a very, very mature code. And as Vince talked about, it's um, you know difficult to look for areas where you can still find performance improvements. And Joel Welling's work at PSC is really in an entirely, well, not entirely new, but relatively new area to high-performance computing, machine learning. So the code's written in Java, um, so you know far less um, compiler optimization techniques that you can take advantage of. Um, so this um, Joel works primarily in the novel and innovative projects um, section of ECFS. So an entirely different viewpoint, and with that, um, why don't you take it away, Joel, and I'll advance the slides for you. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Can people hear me? Um, well, I'm going to presume that, that everyone can hear me all right, kind of facing the screen and away from the phone here. Uh, this was indeed a novel and innovative uh, projects project. It was done with Jana Diesner at uh, UIUC. Uh, she is, in fact, a a former CS student who has gone on to be faculty, former CS student at CMU who has gone on to be faculty at UIUC, uh, and working for her was a guy named Brent Fegley. Brent was the one who did most of the Java work and with whom I interacted directly. Uh, this is uh, a machine learning project, and machine learning is kind of an appealing possible discipline for uh, new and innovative projects because there's an awful lot of compu uh, computation involved and people just don't tend to do it in a high performance fashion. Uh, can I have the next slide? So from their point of view, um, they have lots of experiments that they would like to do that have a running on the order of a week if they are um, run with a single process. but they would like to scale that down, and it looks pretty easy just to, just by using uh, thread parallel uh, methods to get that down by a factor of 10 or 20, uh, and then that'll allow them to move on to some more interesting, more elaborate problems. Uh, and for us, as I say, I think machine learning is a really obvious candidate to grow as an HPC discipline, and given some time and some uh, codes, uh, we could make a real contribution there. But there are all sorts of social barriers that are sort of working through one code at a time. Uh, next slide. So uh, conditional random fields. Um, this is a machine learning technique which is used to um, typically you have a sequence of something, like a sequence of words, and you want to attach labels to it. And the way you do that is you have a bunch of training examples, other sequences, sequences of words which have already been attached. And um, based on the known right answers and a set of dates associated with the, the words, you attempt to find uh, well, you attempt to find the best fit for a set of weights that go from those states to the appropriate labels. And it's not like a hidden Markov process, but not quite. That is to say, there is a, a sort of a chain. If, if I think of a, com a concrete example where I have a sentence or a paragraph, and I move through that sentence one word at a time, and I have sort of a 
a label associated with that word, like this is the first word in a sentence, or this word represents a kind of noun. Uh, what I'm trying to infer is some new piece of information, like find the whole noun phrase, collective group of words which together drive a, fill the role of a noun in the sentence, or identify some new kind of entity in the sentence based on known labels. Uh, so you can think of a sort of a chain of states going on in the background as the program moves through this uh, sentence. And there are transition weights between those states. And you're trying to optimize the transition weights to give you the right, the new state that best fits the sentence. So at any given time, you're optimizing a large set of uh, transition weights, maybe tens of thousands of transition weights across a big corpus of text. And each of those, each of the text examples contributes to a function which you're trying to minimize. Um, and when you get the minimum, those are the best weights. So those are the ones that correspond, that produce output labels which both best match the hand labeled training data. Um, next slide. So, Diefner's group, uh, they're trying to identify entities within unlabeled text. Um, and they have a bunch of training examples, which is roughly 250,000 or 25,000 labeled paragraphs, hand, hand labeled paragraphs from the Wall Street Journal. Um, and I don't know if you can read the, the text at the bottom of the slide there, but for example, some of the labels are, it has been hand labeled that Intel Corporation is an organization of corporation type. It has been hand labeled that 50% uh, is a number of type percent and so on. And each of those flags, uh, depending on the model that you're trying to fit, leads to a state or a transition between states in this chain of, in this internal sort of Markov chain that, that the, the model is optimizing the weights for. Um, in the case of Diesner's group, as I say, there are 95 training examples, each of which is uh, a collection of paragraphs. And they try two different schemes, one of which is just boundaries, like the beginning of a sentence, the end of a sentence, the middle of a sentence, and so on. And that's kind of a, a toy example for making sure that things are working right. The other is categories. The category labeling uses information like the stuff at the bottom of the page there, where uh, as it scans forward in a sentence, it might know that it is now pointing at a corporation name. Um, and in that case, there are 95 different labels available. Um, and uh, because the number of transitions goes as the square of the number of labels, there are more possible characteristics to be optimized. So that case is much, much longer running. Can I have the next slide, please? So, uh, Sunita Tharawagi uh, of the India of the India Institute of Technology in Bombay, around 2006, released a widely used code, uh, which is a Java implementation of conditional random fields, and that is used by uh, Jana Diesner's group. And it has a kind of an internal structure, which I have to talk a little bit about the Java class structure of. Uh, so please bear with me if you're not a Java person. Um, in Java, of course, it's an object-oriented, strongly typed programming language. All sorts of things have classes. Uh, 
classes and you try and build your logic structure out of that it leads to great elegance and flexibility but it makes it very difficult to convert things to the sort of array type operations which are most efficient on classical high performance computers so the first class we have to talk about is called a data iterator or data iter and that is the thing which iterates over say a paragraph from the Wall Street Journal to produce a set of labels uh, and the paragraph from the Wall Street Journal is stored in a data structure called a data sequence then there is a feature generator which takes the output the sequence of labels that the data iterator gives it and produces a sequence of features and it is those features that have weights associated with them that get optimized so for example a data sequence might include the state of each word you're looking at whether it's a, a corporation or a number and the feature generator might look at a pair of states and decide fine I have to include a transition between that or it might look at a pair of states and say fine this is the last element of a sentence I'm going to put a stop feature in here so as the data is read in or as the iteration proceeds uh, the feature generator is turning out the next feature in the set and then there's a uh, class called trainer in the package which Saroagi called CRF that actually optimizes the weights um, the tricky bit here is that as sort of a classic numerical programmer you would think you would run the data iterator over the data sequences to produce a list of labeled text and then you would run the feature generator over that list of labeled text to produce a sequence of features and then you would run the trainer over that sequence of features but that is not in fact what happens what happens is that the trainer is created to know the feature generator and each time it wants to move on to the next example it invokes the feature generator and produces the next feature and the feature generator in turn invokes the data iterator which moves another step down its data sequence so it is not at all a linear process next slide please so how do you know if you're doing the right thing here well they have five training sets their their total uh, 95 training examples are broken up into five sets and it takes four of those sets trains up the conditional random field and then tests the results against the fifth set and it does that for each possible held out set so this is a sort of a five-way round robin over the five sets and ultimately the quality of the measurement the quality of the result you get um, is determined by an average over using each possible set of four as a training set and matching it against each of the leftover ones uh, as I said that they do two basic sets there's the boundary example which uses only five labels and there's the category example which uses 95 labels um, and about 50,000 um, features conditions within the code for which weights have to be calculated uh, because the boundary is much faster typically they'll do 10 optimization steps of that and the whole thing will take about five minutes to run in Java uh, the category case uh, they will run for um, only three iterations and that'll take about an hour running Java. in terms of the development environment straight from their SVN repository I worked in Eclipse setting in my changes as I got them uh, they also use a first version control system called Maven which is kind of 
it's new and different from the sort of thing we're used to in the supercomputing community. Uh, with Maven, you say, I want this particular thing, and it goes out on the web and finds out what the various versions required to build that particular thing of other particular things are, and it basically pulls down a bunch of jar files, which are essentially pre-compiled objects in Java, and stores them by revision uh, on your machine so that depending on what the final library state is, this Maven thing, uh, based on a bunch of XML, is able to figure out what all the uh, objects that get loaded into that are. Um, it's amazing, but I have to tell you, it took me a long time to, to figure out what the heck it was doing. Um, next slide, please. So the serial code has to do this big optimization, and it uses uh, good old LBFGS, which is a, a gradient descent algorithm that comes back from the Fortran days. Original LBFGS was written in Fortran, um, and there is a Java port of it, which is a very straightforward Java port. And like the Fortran, this Fortran code was written before anyone did threaded anything, uh, and stores the position in the optimization space in internal non-thread specific memory in the Fortran. And likewise, the Java implementation stores internal stuff in class variables of the Java. And that means that if you try and run two versions of LBFGS uh, simultaneously, they trash each other. And Fegley had tried to parallel implementation where he ran of these five round robin cases at the same time, and he could never get it to work. And it turned out the reason for that was he was using LBFGS, and LBFGS was using this fixed internal state, which was tromping itself from one thread to the next. Um, next slide, please. How does Java support threads? It actually is very elegant. There's a, we're using an executor service within Java, um, and it is created by a function called fixed thread pool. Fixed thread pool gives you a parallel input queue, parallel output queue, and a bunch of threads that execute the tasks you put into the parallel input queue. And you have to write custom code for what the implementation of the task is, of course. But basically, you just make it up and you feed these tasks to the input queue. It marshals all the necessary threads, and it gives you, gives you back promises. Thomas is a, a sort of a standard uh, computing construct where um, you can just sort of hold this thing, this class instance, and go on about your business. And at some point when you're ready, you ask it for its value. Parallel, if the, the worker thread has figured out that value already, then that value has been inserted into the promise and you immediately get back your answer. Your thread, which is interrogating the promise, doesn't block. But if it, ha if it has not, then when you interrogate the promise, the thread that's asking the question blocks until the promise completes. So it's actually a very elegant way of getting back evaluated value of the function that's being optimized, the entropy, let's say, from the um, from the worker threads that are working in this thread pool. Next slide, please. But LBFGS requires not just the new value of the optimization variable, it also has to get back the gradient direction. <laughs> and that's not as easy. Uh, the promise is a very elegant way of getting back, or the future is a very ele elegant way of getting back the value of the scalar, but there are maybe 50,000 terms in the gradient direction, and we don't want to have a promise hanging out there uh, with 50,000 terms in it for each term. 
so what we do or what i did was make up a worker thread class that sort of accumulated the terms of the gradient factor as it went along and at the end of an iteration at the end of a pass through the uh, heads up, uh, it does a, a merge or a reduction of the, all those different copies of the gradient factor into a global copy which is used to determine the next step but one of the interesting outcomes of this is that the thread each thread gets a contribution to its gradient vector from the training examples that that thread itself handles. And that can vary from pass through the code to pass through the code. So it's not entirely deterministic. Joel, I think I'm going to mute the background noise here and see if this, uh, just one second. Presentation mode is now enabled. Okay, can we still hear you, Joel? I don't know. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. I guess, you know, not my background noise, but what the heck. Anyway, um, the point of that bit is that the order of the addition of the terms of the gradient vector is not deterministic in this parallel code. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So the two examples that they worked on, there is the boundary example, which I said is very simple, and there is the category example, which is much longer running. These are pie charts of the different parts of the boundary example. And you see, for example, the initialization and the comparison with the other, the held out element of the round robin in blue and red, respectively, and the running time of the training in green. So the fraction of the running time which is training for the boundary example is much smaller than it is for the category example. Also the total running time for the boundary example is much smaller. So uh, in terms of potential for optimization from parallelism, the category example is just a much better case. Uh, and that is the one that I'm going to concentrate in the following slide. Next case please. Thank you. So, here are two curves, which are the, let's look at the top graph first. This is the parallel speed up versus the number of threads used in the boundary example, which is the lower curve, and the category example, which is the upper curve. And you'll see that the boundary example, adding more threads leads to poorer for performance after about four threads. And the reason for that is, uh, the overhead of doing the merge and copying, we have to copy around a bunch of class instances, uh, becomes greater than the benefit you get for the relatively short running time for the boundary example. But the category example runs much longer and can reasonably be served by a lot more threads. We ran up to 64 threads, and you can see the curve, the upper blue curve, just starting to, cur to turn down at 64 threads. Uh, so category works much better for thread parallel execution and the training for the category example, this is a log plot, we're actually getting a speed up of about a factor of 20 running at 32 threads on the category example. So that's a very good win. Uh, that's given that most people are going to run this code on uh, a multi-core machine in any case, running this code uh, for any realistic example, um, gives you a speed up factor, uh, well, at 32 threads, up to about a factor of 20 speed up. It's excellent. Um, in terms of tuning for a particular thread, I wanted to look at how the training time versus thread count increased um, for categories. I'm only looking at the categories example now. Um, the blue line is run on 16 cores or 32 hyperthreads, um, and we get by far the best performance when we run on exactly 32 threads. This is interesting because there's a, a way of hiding latency in um, threaded programs 
especially in Java, where you try and run more threads than you have cores to run them on. And while some memory request is out, a thread can sleep and another thread can be worked on. But when we try and do this on supercomputing codes, we very seldom see examples where it actually works. In the case of this code, running hyper-threaded rather than just threaded, that is running both possible threads per core, does win. But when we try and go to more threads per core, um, overloading the cores in the hopes of hiding latency, it does not help. So we get some win from having more threads than actual cores, but we don't get much win, or we start to lose if we try and put even more cores, even more threads on the core. Next slide, please. Um, I had to write this in an inefficient way because Sarawagi's uh, programming interface doesn't provide the feature generator until the training time starts. And in fact, the way things get passed around inside her code is really quite convoluted. Um, also, the internal state of the trainer class is shared all the way across the package. Other objects come in and look at the trainer. So that makes it very difficult to create the threads early on when you would like to create them. If you're doing a multi-threaded program, you want to create the threads as early as possible to avoid the overhead of thread creation. But if we create the threads early, then we would have to replace all the objects known by the threads pretty much every iteration. So for coding simplicity, I actually recreate the thread engine for every iteration. Since an iteration for the categories take, case takes several minutes, this is not a problem. Um, but it's pretty inelegant. Uh, mea culpa. Next slide, please. So where are we with this? First thing to say is that we've shared this parallel trainer class that I wrote uh, with at least one other group that uses Sarawagi's CRF stuff. So we're trying to, you know, maximize the benefit from this parallelization effort. At the moment, they are looking at the difference you get because of the ordered dependency of the calculation. Um, this is an optimization problem. So you can think of the optimization as following a path through parameter space to get to the best possible set of parameters. And if you disturb that path early, the path can be different. Globally, there's a big optimum, a big valley. But because of numerical effects, the bottom of that valley is pitted with lots of different local minima. And depending on the order of operations early, we seem to be ending up in different local minima within that big global minimum. I don't think it's a statistically significant difference in any sense. I think it is the difference you would get if you just permuted the order of the training examples. But I'm still trying to convince the group of uh, grad students who's using this now that that is indeed what we're looking at. Um, so that's about where we are. Um, oh, also I wanted to say that the need to return the gradient vector uh, would make a fully deterministic method very expensive, but it could be done. We'd have to return the gradient vector in the promises. Um, any questions? That's the stuff I wanted to tell you about. Joel, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from folks on the line? I, I think these two talks were terrific examples of how ECSS expertise can really make a difference because I think in both cases these were extremely challenging programming problems that a domain scientist is not going to have the type of expertise that, um, that, that Joel or Vince did to kind of really make these, um, these great strides. I, I was interested to hear, since this is a code that other people use, that you were actually working on repository versions, and so therefore the changes that you made to CRF, those will get picked up by anyone who wants to use it in a threaded way? Um, it's hard to feed the code back to Sarawagi's original set, um, to the original website where Sarawagi's stuff is archived. 
but i'm trying to at least pass it around so that the community knows that it's there yeah and maybe if enough people in the community get behind it we'll be able to plug it into sarah wagner's because the parallel trainer is as far as i can tell completely just plug compatible with the regular trainer right yeah you wonder if there are any um you know journals where we might submit a paper to or places that we might present to kind of um you know expand the exposure beyond the groups at cmu and illinois yeah it's it's tricky in that the machine learning community is a very conference paper driven community and the conference paper is not about the details of the code it's about how closely they were able to fit the training data um, so we can't submit a paper to the place where it would really be read, but maybe a poster about this sort of thing might be presentable at one of these one of these machine learning conferences. All right, interesting. Yeah, it's very very nice work, Joel. Very nice. It's it, it, interesting to hear about the just sort of the the Java implementation of you know, blocking. Uh, collectives and things like that. I'm so used to thinking of it in MPI terminology that this was an interesting interesting talk. Uh, there's a huge gulf between the MPI community and which is the traditional HPC community and the machine learning community which uh, any parallelism it does is going to be on Hadoop and very often even Hadoop seems to be too much of a reach for them. Um, methods are just totally different. Yeah. Yeah, the types of things that you you folks in NIP encounter all the time, I'm sure. So, um, well, thank you very much. We're at the end of our time. Um, both Joel's slides and Vince's slides will be up on the web, and these talks are also recorded. Uh, in case you want to share them with colleagues later on, and those recordings will be up on the symposium website as well. So I want to thank everyone who's joined and thank especially Joel and Vince for taking the time to prepare such excellent presentations um, today. Hope that you will join us next month for the next symposium. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.